Are we ready? Uh, we are on preparing to live stream, setting up your meeting. So I'm going to be watching the chat and putting questions there uh, for y'all. OK. I think Great. we're live. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa Flower with Wordsmith Theater, and this is Elizabeth Kuhn and Elizabeth Bunch. <laughs> um, and we are doing a talk back about the Casterville ghost. Canterville. Uh, hip. <laughs> I'm trying not to say Canterbury Tales, and I'm saying now I said Canter Caster. What did I say? You said Casterville. We also joked about Centerville and Canterbury. It all comes out, but in the we end, we talked about the that before goes. we went live, and now like I'm completely. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, yes, and it's an adaptation from a short story by Oscar Wilde. And um, yeah, so we're going to talk about it. So uh, first, of course, because we usually say, like, what was the seed of writing this play? We know the seed is this short story. But why the short story and what got you started there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've always loved the short story. My first time encountering it uh, was actually the television movie featuring uh, Neff Campbell and Sir Patrick Stewart. My sister and I were big fans. We watched it 157 times. We would argue over, I'm Neff Campbell. No, I've, I'm Neff Campbell. Um, I think at last count, Catherine's Neff Campbell. So all right, it's fine. I'll let it go. Um, but I, I always just kind of loved this kind of ghost story because it wasn't too spooky. I'm a big weenie about stuff like that. And this was um, sort of playful and, and the teen girl is the hero. Um, and in the end, she's the one that really matters. And that's always delightful. Uh, so I had that kind of YA vibe that, that drew me in. And then during the pandemic, uh, I was worried about the theater. Would it be going forward? I tend to write big, honking, epic, world-building, sci-fi, fantasy, magical realism plays. And everything was on pause. So I walked away. I was um, reading short stories. I reread this. And there's this wonderful moment uh, in the story where the Canterville ghost finally appears and talks to Virginia. And even though it's a, a short story, um, this was one of, actually was the first of Oscar Wilde's stories to be published. You can see he's building those playwriting muscles. Um, I'm a big nerd and dramaturg. So actually he had written two plays leading up to this 1887 release of the Canterville Ghost. Uh, both were terribly received. Um, Vera or the Nihilists was the first. The second was the Duchess of Padua. Ever hear of those? No, but he was starting to build those dialogue muscles. And that one conversation between the two of them was super appealing. So that's answer part one. Answer part two, Texas froze. And I was listening to my toilet groan and make all these weird noises and uh, indoor plumbing was just a, a thing of hilarity for about a week there, answer part two. Answer part three, we are starting to kind of come out of our caves and talk about reopening, going and being around people, visiting. Uh, I work with young children, actually having a classroom of them and not just being a talking box. Mm -hmm. And it filled me with anxiety. Um, as much as I love children, as much as I love people like the Otises, who are very much like many of my theater family and theater friends, um, I was a little apprehensive to spend real 3D time with them anymore. And I think that was very much a universal thing that Simon feels as a ghost who doesn't want his life to change. He doesn't want new people around him. He would like things to stay as they are. Um, and when I reread that short story, I had a sort of an aha moment of, I can't be the only one feeling this way. And that one scene with the two of them talking really sounds like dialogue. I should adapt this. Mm -hmm. so those three parts, toilets, <laughs> good dialogue, and uh, anxiety. And that led to this adaptation. I feel like that might lead to a lot of things, those three <laughs> ingredients. <laughs> wow. Um, I actually watched the preview for, because I didn't, um, for that film and it's pretty amazing. It oh, has man. a tone almost of like E.T. or something, but with a ghost. That's what I now, found in the preview. Now, there are an insane number of adaptations of this play. Uh, uh -huh. It's been made into a Russian opera. It's been made into a graphic novel. Uh, the BBC churns out an adaptation probably every five to ten years. Like there are over a hundred adaptations it, that have been It made. also looked like people were using it to learn English. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So it, it is, yeah. It was originally written as a two part short story published in a magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was poking fun at the nouveau riche Americans, <laughs> these upstarts and these staunch old British traditionalists. Um, and so there's kind of a, a good, clean family fun to it that's hard to find sometimes in older material. So I think that's why it keeps getting made. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's, if you ever get bored, folks on the internet, uh, please hop around the 1970s TV versions of Canterville Ghost and watch him emerge for the first time. It is some nonsense. The effects and like the woo, you can't you can't beat the cheese. It's delicious. <laughs> Did you think? Okay, so the first choice that I was like I noticed in your adaptation is that uh, you the family right from the bat believes the ghost is there. And I think other ones don't do that. They're like, the family's like, maybe the ghost is real, maybe they're not. Yes. Um, I think one, one of the, the big things, and this is something, I'm not sure if we talked about um, fellow Elizabeth, so feel free to chime in, is that I wanted to find these moments of heart in the script. Um, but I love the fact that like me, they are uh, kind of, you know, they should be scared. They should be weenies like I am, but in, excuse me, not like me. They're like, oh, you're here. <laughs> cool. You know, it's no big deal. Um, that's such a lovely twist on the haunted Gothic tropes of, oh no, run away, get, get the priest. Like, oh gosh. Um, it's so satisfying that they're not afraid. So I like if they believe, they just aren't spooked. They're tough Americans. I thought that was more fun than spinning the wheels of is he there, is he not, is he real, is he not. Yeah. And then do all the adaptations, and actually Elizabeth Bunch can answer this too, because you did like, there's like these sort of American commercials for like products <laughs> that help clean. Tammany Rising Sun Lubricant. <laughs> um, do all of the adaptations have that like, it's a kind of odd piece, is that like, here's what Americans do, is that what that is? Well, we, we're a, a capitalist bunch, you know, we do veer towards that. I added in the ballpoint pen uh, as a prototype and being a nifty thing, because it, it had been invented by the time this was published, the patent hadn't gone through just yet. Um, but there's that sort of uh, creativity and science and um, consumerism behind them that I thought was, was fun to capture. Um, sometimes in adaptations, they just say lubricants, but I liked the names that Oscar put together, so I wanted to highlight them. Yeah, that is in the original text, right? That he's given the full the full name of some of the products. I think he has fun with the word and the the choices of how to label those. Yeah, I'm sure Elizabeth, I was interested in what you were saying about the different adaptations and how people react as a viewer in any of those. Were they actually scary when the ghost showed up? Were there <laughs> I live with a man who loves horror movies. So what I think of is actually scary. I mean, they, they faint or they go, oh no, you know, but it's clearly just someone in front of a green screen doing this. Um, so it's, it's kind of a big ask. Um, some of the adaptations I'm sure could find a scarier way to present him, especially with the magic of film. Um, but since this was on, well, one day it will be live and on stage. Um, I thought, let's embrace the fact about the human up there and we can all see him and uh -huh. treat him like one. Yeah, I think that works so well that the audience, uh, it's a, it makes the family even more appealing that they react kind of the way we might react when they're like, oh, I like your lacy shirt. <laughs> you should get some oil and lubricant for your chains. They're too loud. Mm -hmm. I loved the, like how you had, I, well, I don't remember what he was supposed to be holding in the script, but he held a box of Kleenex. Yes, yeah, so he's supposed to have uh, a chest with a, a neck rough inside and Elizabethan oh, yeah, collar. To the, represent his wife the list. yeah mm -hmm. and that that was a, a bit of tidying on my part um because he needed a, a, a mushu a sassy best friend to talk to um and i thought that was a good symbol was to have the chest but we chose box of kleenex with our <laughs> our imagination to get the job done very hamlet um, yes absolutely yeah the the woman is the nick so we had the rough for her to borrow from mia vardalos 
What um are there things specific things that came up during the rehearsals or something that was like super interesting that you guys talked about as you got started? Sure. Well, uh, first of all, this is the original Home Alone, <laughs> and we're lucky to have one of our twins with us tonight. This is Bonnie Langthorne. Um, fun fact: in the original short story, the twins are only given the nicknames Stars and Stripes because they're beaten for misbehaving. Ooh. Oh. Yeah, so th that's one of those things that I was like, let me come in with my 2021 goggles and fix that. Uh, so Fingal, Oscar Fingal of Flaherty, Wills Wild. I've cherry picked Fingals and Wills to give them uh, new names to, to operate under as characters, humans. The uh, kind of original shades of Fred and George Weasley as well are in there. Um, but yeah, if, Bonnie, if you want to talk to what it was like to have a twin in the room, it was definitely an interesting experience to have a twin over Zoom because Jesse and I uh, talked about um, in between rehearsals how we just kept watching each other's faces on the Zoom screen. And if Jesse had her mouth open, then I would open my mouth. Or if, she, if my eyes were like really big, she would make her eyes really big. Um, so it was interesting to have like, to be always looking at your counterpart. Um, but I also, I think we, we both talked about how we wanna be these twins in person because we, there are just so many little side shows that we had in, in mind. Um, but yeah, it was, they're definitely like uh, Fred and George prototypes. Um, but I mean, the way that you kind of ex like built on them, they're more than just like, oh yeah, those are the little ones. They, they, they have their own little personality and characters that come out and like even the little part about like, I'm agnostic, I'm an atheist, like what? <laughs> eight or 10 year old kid knows that about themselves or even knows what that is. Um, the same ones that cheat at poker with you know, cards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, there, there were fun little like quirks that you wrote into the script that Jesse and I were, whenever we do this in person, we're ready to roll with that. <laughs> the serendipity of you guys, you all showing up that first rehearsal and also having essentially matching clothes on. By yeah, we both had on striped shirts like, and that hmm. made it into the final cut. Yes. <laughs> Oh, nice. <laughs> and that was it. Pretty perfect. Uh, and then we have Shante, who brilliantly gave us our Virginia Elizabeth Otis. Um, this is an Elizabethan project with Elizabeth Bunch, Elizabeth Earl at Wordsmith. And me, the emails were fascinating. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, Shante, do you want to talk to some of your experiences as Virginia? Yeah, it was fun. I liked how um, I liked how empathetic she was towards the ghost and how um, she cared about his feelings and how it must feel for us to be like coming into his space and being rude like the part where um I say along the lines like it was really improper of us to like beat him with pillows like he's just trying to live his ghost life you know um but I had a lot of fun I I like how I I really enjoyed um the family's like different personalities and um it was I remember mentioning in rehearsal that I love adaptations of older works because we we get to bring especially doing them now we get to show that humans are humans and we've been humans this entire time and we get to show like the that even then women children men whomever had feelings and and quirkiness and it wasn't all just stoic and and there's there's fun there's there's musicality to the language and these are stories that you know even though there are things that are outdated about them we get to learn from them we get to change them we get to grow from it and i, I just i i really enjoy getting to do um stuff like this so yeah i had a good time you lent such a beautiful authenticity and grounded quality to a character that just sort of bringing Elizabeth's view even further into fruition that she wasn't just this sort of lighthearted, typical ingenue that we get so used to not really having a mind of her own. And you gave her such strength. And I really, really admired that in the performance. It was fabulous. I, I, I always get often. so excited to see Shante play an ingenue because I know she's gonna have just this amazing grounded, human intelligent take that's just gonna like totally blow my mind to what that role was intended to be or what I first read the role to be. I'm always like, yes, Shante, she's gonna just change my whole perception of ingenues today. <laughs> oh, I appreciate y'all. It's I, it's an act of rebellion. <laughs> do it. 
and like on screen because we I you know we don't get to see we know like okay we've seen each other in theater but seeing Shantae on screen I was like oh I I want more of that too I want thank you <laughs> it really made the cast have this dynamic that was exciting because I think that the Cecil character shows up and can be a little bit like here I am, I'm the I'm the man that will change your life. Mm -hmm. But Juan did an incredible job of making him sort of appear as Prince Charming, but it was really like, whatever you want, Virginia, because she was already had such, she'd already captured our hearts and had such strength that it was fun. She kept the, the story propelling forward, which is what we really wanted, right? We don't want to get too far with the next door neighbor. Yeah, that was That was one of the fun things to sort of, all right, I'm going to put my aura in here. <laughs> I like strong women. Um, that the original prophecy is when a golden girl can win prayer from the lips of sin. And I was like, Ugh. because there's this implication of like her worth, her merit is tied up in her purity. Virgin. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I was going to ask about that too, sure, because sure. she also has a journey. Mm -hmm. she, she's like at, she's at like, you know, womanhood, or she's approaching womanhood, yeah. and then a ghost, a male ghost, takes her to the underworld. And in the story, I think, I believe she's 15. Um, uh, I made her closer to the cusp of 18. Uh, and it was very important that she has the autonomy to choose to help uh, this 300 year old ghost, murderous ghost, as opposed to, well, you're the closest version, come on, away we go. Hey, -ya, I'll lead the way um that was that was not what we were feeling uh i love the the vulnerability of him needing her um it reminds me of you know when unicorns could only be captured by young women because uh, they were the pure ones who could touch them like that kind of legend um comes to mind but that she gets all the pieces of the mystery and chooses to walk to the edge of the garden of death like that is some chutzpah on this girl that so. is actually like in, because I'm doing just, I'm so sorry, but because I'm doing birth and biopolitics right now, I was, there's a lot of mythology about women, like, uh, and like ancient traditions of women going toward death or approaching death, you know, or journeying to the underworld and then coming, you know, there's all these rites of passage like that. That's actually like a, from like, Samaria. Yeah, multiple cultures. Yeah. When men go to the yeah. underworld, they look behind them and mess everything up. Bless them, they tried. Uh, right. <laughs> but when young women do it, they often save the day. Um, I think yeah. there's a, also a crossover with, you know, anytime a woman gives birth, and we have a couple of mothers on this call, um, they are risking everything, everything for life. Their lives. Yeah. So yeah. that's. And, and like, there's like a death of identity and, and becoming a new mom and all of that. Yeah. So anyway, all of that is built into it somehow. Yeah, yummy, yummy right. stuff. She's she's becoming a woman as yeah. he's unbecoming a man and a ghost and a, you know letting moving on big changes. Yeah. What is it like the seven biggest a move check, <laughs> death check? Yeah. Um, no risk of divorce with these parents. They're very happy, but lots of lots of changes. New love. New love, marriage at the end, sort mm -hmm. of. Did they yeah. they don't actually have the wedding? They just uh, in the original. <laughs> The, it doesn't end with um, uh, Lord Canterville, the current one, and and yeah. Virginia. It ends in the graveyard with the Duke saying, "Darling, you promise, promise me one day to tell me what happened." And she's like, mm -hmm, "Maybe I'll tell the children." <laughs> Not as satisfying after we fall in love with Abe Zapata, like Houston's own. <laughs> God, I'm so glad we got him in the cast, um, and and seeing him transition and that actor getting to then duck back into the little vest and the glasses and like, I'm my own grandson. You know, we all know who he is. And so yeah. there's that lovely double element of her getting to say goodbye um, because the departure does happen off stage. So I wanted to finish with the, with the two leads. Uh -huh. And Oh, I just wanted to add, I love that we don't get to see what happens. I, I, cause it's so, it's so real. Like you don't get to see every part of the story. You only get to hear about it. Even if you're, if you're lucky, you get to hear about it. So I, I really love that, that there wasn't anything crafted for that, that it got to be that. 
You yes. have given yourself such a gift with that, Elizabeth, because you know, at one point I've gone through all these different versions of reading Dracula and there's the whole end of Dracula, which the alley has done, but ultimately you end up in a crypt and you have to have someone coming to life and you have to have stat and it's, I, it, let's have the messenger come back and tell us what happened. <laughs> it's so hard to get that to feel effective. And in the tone of what you've written, which we're having a very, hefty discussion about something that ultimately is very joyful and you know really has a lot of whimsy and wonder to it um so i love that we don't get stuck in trying to go so dark and scary we get to hear that really beautiful you know two character scene where they really have that great dialogue like you were saying um and and that's that's the crux of it then this beautiful way of having you know someone someone sort of become light and tell us what happened off stage it's really fabulous yeah, I should, should probably comment on on both of those so first of all leaving things up to the audience's imagination is my whole steez as as the kids say um i think that especially in the theater your imagination can make a better garden of death than the best possible stage designer um, when I die, one day down the road, whenever that may be, I'm going to think about this play and be like, finally, this, oh, that's what the garden looks like, or it's all blackness. Who knows? I'll find out at last um, on my own private journey through this chaotic universe. Um, but it was important to me to trust that your imagination would bring that up for you. So um, I think that that's the least I can do as a playwright is have faith in you to have a brain and an imagination. Um, but then there is that other moment, and this is this is me showing my oats and my roots of magic, um, where I wanted Mrs. Omni to kind of become more than herself, and she speaks on behalf of Eleanor, who mm -hmm. has been a neck rough slash Kleenex box this whole time, um, and who is kind of the, the missing voice of the narrative in the short story. You know, I killed my wife because she miscooked a deer one time. Like, there's so much more there. There's so there's so much more, and some of it probably lies in the fact that Oscar Wilde was a gay man. Who had been married for three years to a woman named Constance and she had given him two sons back to back and there was probably this strained friendship you know he hadn't met Lord Douglas yet so he's dealing with that while he's writing this story while he's trying to pay the bills because he's got two new kids and he's straining against his wife and then there's me in 2021 always wanting to let the women talk <laughs> um, and hear what they have to say so having this bustling Mrs. Umney almost a uh, stereotypical housekeeper character mm -hmm. stop be alone be trusted with the omniscience of what's happening off stage in that set we also don't have to build or pay for great um and describe what she's what she's seeing um and speak as eleanor with a cool lighting effect I, I think that's that's theater magic that's what we can do while the TV movies and the stage versions, or excuse me, the screen versions can do other things with their cool effects, this is what we can do is accept that that housekeeper is also the voice of Eleanor de Canterville. She has a beautiful voice. Yeah, Sandra Peck Ramsey, hire her too. Hire all of them. Theaters are reopening. As you're planning your seasons, cast these people, please. Yeah, put us to work. Yeah. Um, Oh, I should say what the comments uh, some uh, Lindsay Ball said. Please. Just wants, uh, she just wants to listen to Elizabeth talk about all the things. Must be why I like I like her plays so much. Um, yeah, and then someone uh, else. I get maybe that's Ian actually agreeing that the viewer's imagination can do much more than the stage crew can. Ian knows what's up as our, our wordsmith admin. Thank you, Ian, for everything. <laughs> I feel like that's something this. This is not the first time you've played with that. It's almost becoming your like signature to, you know, I think of Corona specifically where you create a whole sci-fi world just by turning the lights off. Yeah, this is my thesis. <laughs> oh, God. Heavy um, old, dear old book. Um, and those... it's just so cool. Like I think of that moment in Corona when the lights go off. I mean, I know a lot of people may not have seen or read that script, but <laughs> like there's so much world and stuff happening but nothing's really happening it's all sound and in your imagination and you're this is just a different way to play with that same idea that is really cool sure let me uh help the listeners out just with the lightning fast catch up on what that is yeah so I wrote a play called corona <laughs> 
<sighs> Since changed the title to Ariadne, it's the myth of Ariadne and Theseus and the Minotaur, but set in space, because of course, um, and on the spaceship, the lights go out and the monster comes out whenever it's dark. So there is a moment where it goes full black on stage and the monster runs by and the lights come up and one of the scared people throws out these clumps of brown fur. So what's actually happening in the dark is the actress is like, okay, that cue is coming, pockets, lights on, fur. Yeah. <laughs> but it, what it means to those of an audience is that <gasps> with these sound effects, a big giant honking cow monster has come through here and she fought it off and got a handful of its fur. That's so. fun. Yeah, I was oh, a good babysitter. Yeah, I like to play. Uh, I want to see theater magic again. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, and only theater can do that. I mean, you yeah. can I mean, we have to be, uh, we have to have the danger of like, is this really going to happen? Are they going to fail? Are they going to make this work? And it is magic when you engage our imagination and we don't know where you're going and you surprise us and mm -hmm. movies are uh, it's just a different thing. And we love them and we eat popcorn and we go to them and that's great. But I love that especially here with this setup, we've got this stable set. You know, we have the, the library and the state on the floor and the fireplace. And we think, okay, we're here, we're in it to win it. They're going out to the garden, but we're, we must be staying here. And then that wall opens up when you aren't expecting it and they walk into the wall. That, mm -hmm. that's, that's what we do. That's why I get up in the morning to do stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Shente's ready to climb through. <laughs> Um, but there was some, we do try to do kind of theater magic in Zoom readings. And any credit, any of it goes to Elizabeth Bunch. I want to state that up front uh, as my film editor, extraordinaire, sound effects, music, cool transitions, going from two cameras to one camera. I, yeah, I don't even know how to, do, how do you make the voices come when one person is there? <laughs> I movie baby it was crazy I had a lot of fun but it's it, you know and it wasn't what was really great is that we talked about in rehearsal right away we can let the string show like it, we're not going to hide that this is a zoom reading and so the the actual like group decision to make that rough out of a Kleenex box was truly like well what if we tried this what if we tried this what if it was a coffee filter what if it was just the kleenex box and you know oh well could he pull it out could he like what is he gonna do he can use it then somebody i can have a kleenex box at my house so then it just became kind of this wild thing but you know people showing up in striped shirts together and abe went out and got a light at the uh five below so he could make like purple light or green light and then i got really into it when i was editing it together and said, okay, well, now I can put an iMovie effect on that and make it really vibrant when that changes. And now I got to put in some owl sounds and... <laughs> because I miss theater magic and I couldn't just, you know, I, I had to, I had to rise to the material a little bit in the post-production stuff. Yeah, we, we were fortunate in our enthusiasm and competency. <laughs> so that was a great cocktail. Very proud about how tech savvy, like we're becoming um, in the in the theater, I just saw, uh, like City Company just did a collaboration with some a group in Singapore, but they didn't actually go there. They're doing Three Sisters, and they're part of the cast, but they're projected, City's projected, and they're acting with the actors on stage. And we're like in a whole new, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, you think about the Zoom yeah. performances we were watching 14 months ago or yeah, maybe people Yeah, really better. We we ever collectively as a global <laughs> theater entity, we are getting better. And I think that that's great because we don't have to let it go away completely. If you want to collaborate with somebody, if, you know, somebody is in a different state, like maybe other people on this call end up going to other places soon. I mean, we doesn't mean we're not going to collaborate anymore. I can still ask the same people to come and do a reading or we can workshop this again and we can continue to connect this way because we're getting better at doing this. Something that I, I want to add to that is that the ability to get to watch other stuff because so much of our artistry and our industry, I think depends on being able to see 
other pieces of work. There's only so much you can do. There's you, there's a lot you can do in your own mind, but I think that there's only so much, at least I'll speak personally, there's only so much I can do in my own mind. So being able to go on YouTube and watch Bristol Old Vic production, even though it wasn't Zoom, but like people are, the, the fact that theaters are now more open to the idea of streaming, it makes theater more accessible, which is something that I'm super passionate about because these tickets are expensive and I get it and I want to pay full price because I want to pay full price to pay the artist and I only got but so much money. So it's like nice to be able to know that I can, I can do a donation here, I can do a donation there, I can do a donation there and still get to participate in global theater and it just like helps for everything to like, it, it connects the whole world. So I, I, I love, I love. <laughs> I also want to, I like just shout out too, because it makes it more accessible to parents because you cannot yes. take your kids, like little kids to theater, but you can pay to watch something on Zoom, you know, and you don't have to hire a babysitter to do that. Or and the Critical Ghost, which is free, thanks to Wordsmith. And if you want to make a donation <laughs> to Wordsmith, you should be oil board. They'll use it to make more plays. <sighs> Help us make plays. I also want to say that it, but in the same way it does for parents, it makes it more accessible for other artists too, because if you're doing the thing, you can't always go see the thing anywhere else. So it, I mean, it, it actually, even though we are all in our own little boxes, it makes us more tightly knit. Yeah. I love a breakfast play. Like I'm smarter when I wake up than when I go to bed. I'm way less <laughs> smart by the end of the day. So I love waking up and enjoying a play first thing, like having coffee and just like absorbing um, that language, whatever they're doing, like what tricks they got and then moving on. So yeah, that freedom of, of choice and um, you know, Netflix has spoiled us a little bit, yeah. but you gotta get it where you can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it'll still be great. Like even a, a it's like Ace is so small and he knows like if I have, a few people like my cousin over and his friend and we're talking he's having a great time if i get on zoom and i'm like this is the same thing i'm interacting with people he's completely freaking out so there's like absolutely still yeah still some yeah you want i want to get like you know a few people here and watch something together you know that kind of thing um okay play back to play yeah, yeah. there was uh one thing, if I was to say like, oh, if this is a Shakespeare play, I would still call it a kind, it may be a problem play because it changes so much in tone. It starts out kind of funny and this funny ghost and then, and then the story gets into this like lesson play and then I don't quite know how to situate it. Um, as oh. you were looking at it, yeah, we, we talked, I think Shantae, you brought up, sh there's shades of Shakespeare there, like you can see where Wilde consumed his elders mm -hmm. um, and turned around and, and poked fun with this. Ultimately, it's, I mean, technically, it's a satire um, of, right. of the Americans oh. and the Brits, and it ends in a marriage, so it's a comedy. It is a comedy, but it has like that, this like dark, like yes we're gonna learn about love and death for a second right and that's i think that's the, the romantics tiptoeing through the tulips in the back um i let them i love a little romance a little despair why not <laughs> part of life despair and the and the satire and the satirical comedy makes it funnier absolutely i mean absolutely makes it funny um we love our our importance being earnest or um ideal husband and lady windermere's fan and there's always that moment of Oh, all this lost. No, it's not. La la la, the end, right? Um, <laughs> Everything. So in, in a tight little hour, one act, had, we dipped down pretty far. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with how, how dark we get and then spring back up. That's yeah. why it's that's why it's successful. That's what because it's a roller coaster. If it's just a comedy that goes up, up and up. I mean, even Shakespeare's comedies there. It's paint. You know, you look at Twelfth Night. Olivia just lost her oh, yeah. brother, it, you know? Yeah. It's all about pain and it's about coming out of that and finding the joy again. Or sometimes the funniest thing is seeing how desperately sad someone is. And like, I mean, we laugh at Abe when he's the when he's the ghost because it's ridiculous. He's in despair in the WC with like the pipes rattling and people knocking because they need to come in and poop. It's like, it's, it's humiliating and that's why it's funny. Oh, 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, that's like a huge laughing at people's pain is like, yeah, right now I'm hitting my head on the wall and Ace is like on the floor cracking up. So uh, um, the other, like, cause I had uh, maybe thought too deeply about the uh, commercials. Um, but I was thinking about, I wonder, because I'm always looking for Oscar Wilde's like um, doing some sort of political statement or, and I'm wondering, I wondered about how Americans are using like commercialism to sort of ruin the ghost story in a way. And, and how like part of him mocking them is that they just like, we were maybe Americans are so expressive and so locked into this like sort of capitalist, we make things, we solve problems that like the mystery of a ghost story just is like completely, we can't even process it. We can't even do it. Right. Um, I mean, there's, there's as always layers to it. Uh, there's the fact that he's a third party as an Irishman um, watching the possessiveness of the British Empire and the possessiveness of the upstart Americans um, and just look at these two commenting on it from that that third point of view hmm. um, and then there's just the the joyful 180 of, of all those stories that were being churned out of um, the, you know the ghostly I drowned myself in the carp pond um, oh no I was spurned in a love affair and I had to duel and I was shot oh, you know there's there's a I don't know that we had pearls to clutch just yet. That wasn't the look. Uh, Bonnie's our fashion expert. Um, the, you know, the lace to clutch um, in, in concern for that. And so subverting that expectation of fear and instead turning it into the ghost being afraid. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a nice little twist. New way to look at the story. Yeah. Um, do y'all have any questions or comments that y'all wanted to give and then also opening it up if any questions or comments from the audience. I know y'all can do that like throughout, but we're kind of at that like point. Yeah. Of things I could, I'm like. Elizabeth, did you yes. have any, did you have any Beetlejuice in your head when you were writing this at all? Oh. Not at the front of the mind, but there's some marbles loose in the back that roll around. I definitely um, can fully confess to being inspired by Gomez and Morticia for what I gave to Lucretia and Hiram. That, that kind of love is not explicit in the original text. Um, but I'm a big fan of the Adamses as a member of a non-traditional height couple. I think it's always nice to see good love on stage. Uh, and my favorite line might very well be Hiram's exit line. Um, in exchange for a kiss, I'm willing to hear every opinion you've ever had. Some more non-toxic masculinity for the room, put that in the universe. Um, but I, now I see Beetlejuice, because again, we have the older kind of magical man and the younger girl, um, you know, trying to help him out and make him better. Oh. And they sort of turn Beetlejuice into the, that's the commercial entity for them. They're like, ooh, we're going to market, you know, they've got that I'm going to market him and have people come over for parties and, you know, he'll entertain and he's, he hits that wall. But it was so funny. I was thinking about earlier when we were talking about the ending, it does, because of what this ghost has, we care about what happens to him and where he's going with Beetlejuice. We have to care about Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin instead, because Michael Keaton's kind of a jerk. So we just right. kind of want to get rid of him completely. But you know, this ghost has so much more heart. But it yeah. did it did pop into my mind quite often. And given given my druthers, I will always care about what's happening with Gina Davis, uh, <laughs> American archer, heroine, tall goddess. Um, but I will say, when I wasn't fighting my sister for the right to be Nev Campbell, I tended to watch the Beetlejuice cartoon if we want to go full retro, and that was more um, playful and uh, less like you know gory effects. It was more. Um, well, we're off on another adventure. What are we going to get into this time? And it'll all be okay within 20 minutes. And that kind of friendship that grew between them was was what I really enjoyed about that cartoon. So that's probably the the more present Beetlejuice in my mind. What if actually for each of you, like if you could have a version of this ghost in the theater, so like say we're staging the play, what does the ghost look like? 
Oh, like the the Luke like bed sheet or yeah. Uh, I think we we messaged a little bit about the Marley and Marley and the Muppet Christmas Carol. Uh huh. Because if you if you can't go to the alley, you're gonna watch Muppet Christmas Carol for your <laughs> Carol needs. <laughs> With the all white flower. All white. Look. Yeah, just um, like classic Dickens. I think if you're looking for some theater magic, this ghost doesn't need to fly right? This is not the spooky flying ghost. I think you got, I think the theater magic you're looking for in this ghost, I don't know what his design is, but you've got to get an illusionist on board that helps you get him to walk through walls. There has to be a way that he can permeate so that he can come in and out of these rooms. That's what I would imagine. It's like finding an amazing theater magic for that. I may say hoverboard under a cloak. Um, <laughs> or like a long robe, just to kind of like give him that kind of un- in human movement, um, but definitely not on a wire. Please, Kay, thanks. <laughs> they have that, we had to do that ghost walk for um, Ghost Sonata, where like, where, uh, like in, in Japanese theater, they, they believe that all ghosts don't have feet. So you have to walk in this like, really careful way that's super smooth so it like imitates like if you're wearing a gown that you're just going like ding, 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 ding. glide mm. have you seen mark rylance enter in 12th night when he played olivia he can he can do that <laughs> he just floats it's amazing mark rylance, my, mark rylance trained with city company there you go. All small town comes together. Yep, if you're out there and you're watching this and you want to play the ghost, how do people follow my people, which is just me? Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> I I, th I mean, I'm saying that I could be like completely, but I'm like 90% sure because they've talked about him. Um, and then there was some other thing I was going to say. Oh, I kind of have this image now, like thinking about him, like lubricating the chains of like a very old, like kind of grumpy old man that has just too many objects that he needs to clean or fix. <laughs> uh, but that's like such a close in view. I just have him, I just see him like trying to fix shoes or something and just it not, it, and grass is growing out of them because he's just been there so long. Even that simple act, the I, just the, the journey of the lubricant through the play, if we can just hone yeah. in on that for a moment. I mean, it is because he, I mean, he, wants, he wants to scare them by making this noise. And as they start to defeat him, he does end up oiling the chains because now he's trying to sneak around and it's his house. I mean, it really is part of his journey. He doesn't want, he wants them to be loud. He's trying to scare them. And then suddenly they've defeated him and he's sitting by himself oiling his chains and he's taken his shoes off and the kids are leaving nuts out so he can't walk around. I mean, they really, they're torturing him. But in some ways it's, it's like he deserves it because he killed his wife. You got to go back to the whole reason this is happening is he's kind of a bad dude. And yeah. so he, I mean, he gets kind of the full circle. He gets tortured and then finally... Shantae lets him go. Shantae, you big softy. Thanks again. <laughs> it's interesting that he, because I feel like the reason people are scared of ghosts is that a ghost in theory can do something to you, can hurt you or, but it looks like he can't do anything. You know, he doesn't have that power to like actually cause harm anymore. He can just make you think that he can. Right. Well, he, when he talks about his, his big plan in the toilet, right, when he's, <laughs> he's sitting there going over, you know what, I was, I was going to, I was going to put my hand on their, on their head. I was going to wait for secret, cling to the ceiling and have a rolling eyeball. Um, none of these things are actually causing harm. All of his power lies in his ability to make someone else afraid. And he lacks that entirely here. So he's powerless, which is a switch. Um, and I think it's good for him. Yeah, he, all of his, his victims kill themselves, right? Like once he's haunting, he scares them into jumping into the lake and running away and all these things. Like he, he doesn't, he doesn't have any of that power. Yeah. I always think about what would, you know, so what's the age range for this play if it's on stage? I mean, can an eight-year-old see it? Do you have to be 12? Like, are there there are I mean, some bloodthirsty eight-year-olds out there. <laughs> <laughs> My Bless kids, when they were eight, can see it, yeah. But 
But I don't know. I mean, I, I also think that we really like getting a jump and we like getting a startle. And that's part of theater too, is feeling a little off kilter for a moment. So you want him to be a little scary at some point. Yeah. And I, I confess, I went full Victorian myself um, with the, the sense of morality and good and evil. And I, I made him a little bit better than he is in the original because I have him killing these people for a reason. Um, he doesn't always, like he just had the butler shoot himself. I had a, the, the butler was stealing bacon um, to make it more forgivable. I mean, you shouldn't kill yourself. Just eat the bacon. It'll be fine. But there, there were little tiny fixes to at least give him a reason to behave as poorly as he does. Bacon? Bacon? Yeah. Um. <laughs> the bacon product placement. Uh, it's just mm. so many places for product placement. <laughs> Oh, great. Wow. Um, I'm trying to think of like a good, well, one of the things that's also interesting too is because they're so, uh, plays, they're like so interested in like sort of occult and those kinds of things. Um, a lot of these like ghost stories. We don't have a lot of good like modern just a ghost story just a plain old ghost story yeah well these uh, things come in, in vogue and you know in waves sort of thing uh, um shout out to our friends at classical with their production of ghost sonata and blithe spirit you know they they do exist um but I, the time was ripe for some more ghosts it had been a minute um, yeah and thank you again for the drawing of the ghost if, on the branding that was also melissa with credit where credit's due um, that cute little image for the production comes from you. I weirdly spent so much time on that face. <laughs> Striking the balance, right? You need the despair, we need the humor. <laughs> yeah, like how, what's his expression throughout this entire play? <laughs> like this, you know, the, yeah, I was, I, I spent a, it was very strange. And I had made like, these rich textured images or whatever. And then I was like, no, I think this one. <laughs> yeah. And this you know, it's, it's, it's deceptively simple, right? Three dots and a sheet and we care. Um, and as Shante said, like there's, there's this sense of back, back through time. We've always liked ghost stories. As long as we've had a fire to sit by and a darkness to look at, we wondered. Um, so I think that that never goes out of, out of vogue or out of conversation. Um, what's up with that garden? We're all going to find out one day. It's not surprising that it came to you during the great blackout of Texas too. I mean, <laughs> that's when we first texted about it. And yeah. so Elizabeth was working on it. And so I, I was like, well, so I went and found the source material in Red Wilds with my couch pulled right up against my fireplace. Oh, <laughs> I was wow. like, it's a good time for a ghost story, you know? So I think there are times where, you know, that's what we want. And I I think, I feel like as a culture, there's a lot of true crime that's happening right now. And I think we are all coming out of our own kind of trauma and we might be ready to go back to the ghost story now and get away from the true crime for a bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, escapism, please. Yeah, Chicken, yeah, yeah. Actual fiction rather than like life being, feeling like fiction would be, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we've been living that. We've been living that and the sci-fi. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good on that. <laughs> the um, William has a comment. Uh, what a beautiful play about love and forgiveness, and also very witty and funny. Seamless, excellent direction and acting too. My first question is both Elizabeth's. <laughs> on Zoom, this play was about an hour and six minutes. How long do you think a live production is? And then. Uh, second question is, if this play is only about 45 minutes or so, are you thinking of a companion one act to create an evening of entertainment, so to speak? He's hoping for this. So like, I think he's asking you to write a second companion piece. <laughs> Thank you, William. Uh, Punchy, you wanna go first? What do you think? It's, it's difficult because it's really perfect right now. And it's also why I had so much fun working on this is because this is how much I want to watch on Zoom. And <laughs> it felt like just the right thing, you know? Um, 
a companion piece would be that would be really cool and interesting i also think that this could be expanded another 20 minutes and between that and the action and the drama that's actually going to happen on stage and and when i figure out how to get people to walk through walls i think <laughs> i this could this is this can be a standalone piece yeah, we should talk to Juan about that. Juan, who played Duke Cecil, he's a gifted magician and circus performer and soldier uh, of things. He might have ideas on walls. Yeah, just what I was like, can you do a magic trick? He's like, oh, like this? Okay, Flower. good. work. Record yeah. it, done. <laughs> hire, hire Juan Sebastian Cruz, thank you. Okay, um, I, William, good question. I've been kind of on the fence about it. I was thinking, okay, if I wanted to partner this with something, would I want to diversify what I pair it with? Would I want to try to find a story written by a woman? Would I want to write something brand new myself for 2021, like a modern ghost story? Do I just want to stretch it? Um, I will say that after our first read through, I went back in that night and added lines for Wesley Whitson's character of Washington, um, oh. because I think he's very anemically written in the original. Um, we gave him a cat, that's Moot the cat, the, the real pressing question for tonight, that's Moot. Um, and I couldn't resist adding him into the show. But there's there's so much there with Washington wanting a friend and not getting one and being great with like, he's the CSI spinoff with all of his his potions and unguents and uh, ah. chemistry kits. So it, it could be, I think you're right that we could stretch it, but I, I don't, wouldn't want to stretch it much. It, it feels... Can we steal from American Horror Story? You can write a companion piece where you use the same cast, but to tell a different scary story. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely recycle the cast because at nine, it's it's a hefty keel cast. But it's so fun to see actors then switch into right. you know suddenly oh, Abe wow. is the is the nice guy and you know Wesley is the evil one and right we turn the twins back into beautiful poof ingenues again. Um, <laughs> is there be fun. is there anything that you're going to change after this re reading? Maybe. <laughs> and that's the lovely thing about a reading and having that, that ability um, mm -hmm. is now I'm, I'm able to start, I've, I've done some healing, right? My toilet's flush again. <laughs> I'm, I'm able to start to visualize putting together a night in the actual 3D theater with 3D breathing, 3D walls. So I might start thinking about, do I wanna write specifically for this cast and write a short thing that flips it on its head? Do I wanna give Washington his spinoff story that he deserves? Um, there's, there's room to play. So whatever I choose to pair with it, I might then retroactively futz. For the most part, I feel like it's pretty satisfying as is. It's a sweet little hors d'oeuvre um, and it, it warms my heart. So thank you for letting me hear it out loud because me doing all the voices was not nearly as good as y'all doing all the voices. I would watch it. <laughs> There's the companion piece. <laughs> That's the companion. No good British accent, not one. <laughs> the playwright just comes out and does Wanders well. the whole island. It's, <laughs> just infuriating. Uh, 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 okay, well, great. Well, thank you guys for um, doing all of this. It was a wonderful um, piece to watch. And uh, yes, hire everyone here, please um for more work and yeah hopefully the next time we see you all will be in a theater thanks audience thanks for tuning in this week yeah thank you <laughs>